What we did instead is we did not. The market rallied. We, we felt, you know, we were just clouded in our judgment. And yeah, that we were not scaling the firm the way we should have. So that was, that was probably one big one. The other one was after the liquidation, I should have just had blinders on to the media and focused on creditors only and probably just had a round table and said, these are what I think the options are. What do you think the options are? And if that were the case, I think we probably wouldn't be in bankruptcy. We would have found uh, one of the solutions that I just mentioned. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leung, and today's conversation totally deviates from my usual format. Joining me today from an undisclosed location, Carl Davis, co-founder of Three Arrows Capital. Under normal circumstances, I will have them dig into their investment thesis, career highlights, and how they are helping the crypto ecosystem. But today, we are mostly focused on the demise of 3AC from Carl's point of view. One di quick disclaimer before we start. I am a Web3 investor and a retail crypto trader, but I do not have any business dealings with Sue and Carl from 3AC, except that we have a couple of lunches together and talking about other things. I have my own opinions on the recent crypto crash and the players involved, but I won't be sharing any of my own perspectives today. The aim is to let Carl share his story from his perspective and let the audience decide for themselves where they stand. Of course, everything we discuss here does not constitute investment advice, but for informational purposes only, so do your own research. With that out of the way, Carl, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. By the way, not undisclosed, I'm, I'm here in Bali. Mm. Okay, I think the best way to start, can you give a brief introduction of yourselves and your background? before you started Three Arrows Capital with Suzu? Sure. Sue and I actually both started at Credit Suisse, working on the equity derivatives trading desk. We were trading things like structured products and convertible bonds. And I stayed there for three years. Sue moved to Flow Traders, which is an ETF high-frequency trading shop. Mm. And then after that, I read Arthur Hayes' uh, essay number three that talks about how you both started in Trade Five. How do you both ended up switching to crypto after arbitrage trading on foreign currencies? Sure. In many ways, the crypto market is very similar to the TradFi market. There's We looked at futures, forwards, spot. In other ways, it's very different. If you look at the clearing model, prime brokerage, financing, these are completely different in it. We, we could actually spend about two hours going through this, but uh, I'm sure you have some, some other questions as well. Mm. And I think maybe the easiest way to get into in depth into the question is actually to help my general audience of this podcast who may not be into cryptocurrency. Maybe can you explain a little bit about what market making and margin trading are specifically in the context for crypto? Yeah, sure. So market making very simply is providing liquidity such that when a buyer comes in, a genuine buyer there may not be a genuine seller at the price that they want. A market maker will warehouse that risk for a period of time and wait until they find a genuine seller. Margin trading is the idea that you can borrow funds and trade beyond what you have deposited in a specific account. And so this is where I want to talk about what happened to Three Arrows Capital, but from your point of view, and also discuss some of the recent things that are happening in crypto as well, specifically about the FTX collapse. The way I want to talk about the main subject of the day is that I will break the conversation into four parts. The first part is the investment thesis of Three Arrows and the trading before the Three Arrows Tracy's collapse, the crypto crash immediate aftermath after the Terra Luna collapse, and then the fouling of Chapter 15 bankruptcy. And then lastly, I just want to get your perspectives on the current storm after FTX collapse, depending on when we're publishing this podcast. But then again, let's start. Maybe... The first thing I know is I understand that both Sue and you have this crypto super cycle thesis. Can you explain how do you came to that thesis and how did it influence your hedge funds trading strategies? Uh, sure. So the idea of a super cycle is that we uh, crypto is hitting mainstream adoption. And it's somewhat analogous to, let's say, the Web 2 tech after the 2001 bubble, where there are there's still volatility, there's still pullbacks, but on, let's say, a 30 to 40% pullback in the market, we would generally be a better buyer. This was, I, I think, still is true to some extent, but the usage definitely is not keeping up. 
with some of the price action. And furthermore, 2020 to 2022 was really a massive credit bubble. So I'm still constructive, but that that's the idea. Mm. And then how does it influence how the hedge funds trading strategies then? I think because you believed in this crypto super cycle, right? So it does give you some idea on how to think about decentralized finance or what we call DeFi. Yeah, we invested in a broad array of ideas and, and innovation in the space, whether it was DeFi or you know various protocol uh, scalability solutions, uh, NFTs. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. But generally speaking, the way it influenced our trading is we invested pretty continuously. We tried not to time the market per se with an investment. We would just invest continuously through a cycle. And with trading, generally on the 30 to 40% pullbacks, we we're better buyers. And also, I think you have done an NFT fund, uh, Starry Star and Ray Night fund with uh, Vincent Van Gogh. Okay. And also, I think Defiance Capital for a little bit of the DeFi piece of the trading as well, right? That's right. We actually had several groups. So we had an OTC group that would focus on more of the client facing stuff. We had an arbitrage trading team that would look at more of the, the spreads. We had, you know, a, more of a venture focused team. And then, yeah, and then an NFT team as well. Mm. So as you set up all this, I think you probably also have governance and risk management as well. Yep. So that we each group had is was run pretty independently. Uh, the idea being that if we wanted to invest in NFTs, let's say, I had a you know a broader thesis on it, but I was surely not the best person to do that. Vincent Van Do, VVD was, mm. and uh, he has probably one of the biggest NFT collections in the world. Same goes for DeFi with Arthur Chung, and same went for our client facing business as well. Yeah. Mm. So I think one interesting thing that triggered a lot of this is. I think the highlights I would say is the GBTC trade that you made in the past. And you definitely would have made a huge profit if you have taken away money off the table in 2021 when Bitcoin prices were all-time high because GBTC was trading at a premium and then moved into a discount. Then after that, in during that period of time, people were copying your trades. Madwatch, which I think that, fact that even though I'm a fan of their podcast, alleged the trade that you made, given that you told him that they shouldn't publish that. Uh, on that. And that led to the speculation that you guys have started to have problems when GBTC is trading at a discount and then turn to the Lunar Terra trade. Can you actually verify uh, did that really happen or it's just a separate trade altogether? You're looking at different things and then just invest in them. Yeah, sure. So we actually did very well off of GBTC and the Ethereum trust as well, ETHE. Those were relatively bear market trades. Those happened in 2019, 2020, 2021. And we as we got bigger, we had to do a statutory filing for over, mm. as we're the largest holder of GBTC. We own more than 5% of the trust. And when we did that, the trust was still at a premium. So I was still okay to talk about it. That's because as you would subscribe, you would wait six months and then you'd be able to sell and harvest that premium, right? But when I went to a discount, I was very wary about talking about it. That's because as the largest holder, you're kind of like a whale in, in, the, in the book. And if you, you can decide to sell, you can decide to buy more, you can decide to, uh, you know, the timing of that. And I just didn't want to give up any of my thought process at that time, because if it leaked, the minnows would be front running all of my trades. And that would have been Matt and Nick, basically. Mm. And so that's the reason why you didn't talk, you didn't want to talk about it and leave it as it is. Yeah, exactly. So so we did have a position, but I just thought, given that the trust was at a discount and that the decision node wasn't as clear, before you would just sell. You'd wait six months, you'd sell. But after there were there was a lot more game theory to it, I did not want to leak my hand. Mm. And also, that is also not the reason why you turn to the Lunar Terra trade. That's a separate thing, right? Because there are a lot... Oh, there, I mean, the timing of that is like over a year different as well, by the way. So that has, yeah, almost nothing to do with it. Uh, mm. I, th I, th I think the other interesting point is that there has actually been a lot of red flags raised on Do Kwan's algorithmic stable coin. Specifically, uh, Gavin Joe from Galore Capital explained why the stable coin is actually getting more and more insolvent as it got bigger, right? I, I guess the, the question is not so much about, you know, why the trade was made, but I think the question to me is you probably have read all the 
interviews out there, people raising red flags. Why did you both not pull out of that trade then? Given that you all have started to do a lot onto the Terra USD ecosystem. Yeah, good question. Right. So I have a lot of respect for Kevin. Kevin's a smart guy. That said, there are a lot of other people on the other side of that as well, right? When we mm. invested, we participated in the LFG round, which raised a billion dollars. We did 200 million of that. So that means there were a lot of other people that participated as well. And uh, Jump, Delphi, to name a couple. The argument at the time was that the world needed a decentralized stablecoin. This was the biggest one. In general, scale matters. And it was known to be unsustainable with the high anchor rate. So the main usage of UST, the stablecoin itself, was to deposit onto anchor and earn 20%. But that wasn't the only thing that they built. They built lots of other usage for UST. And as that rate would be lowered to a more sustainable rate, the usage of the other protocols would go up and that would be more sustainable over time. Mm. Uh, what, what are the other things that were built that you mentioned here? Is it like, for example, metaverse related stuff or NFT related stuff? It was across the board. Payments was a big one. But frankly, the idea was an entire ecosystem. It was no, there was going to be no one specific thing. And yeah, and what you asked what happened. What ended mm. up happening is that after our LFG round, the, the team made the decision to diversify the reserves from just Luna to Bitcoin and some other coins as well. But the way they executed it was not amazing. So they gave a lot of UST to Genesis, which then immediately lent it or sold it to other firms, which in a relatively coordinated fashion, just sold it immediately, right? And as the first question you had, what is a market maker? A market maker's job is to hold a position and wait for a genuine buy, right? And there were genuine buyers. There was, I, I, I was told that, you know, 10 figures worth of buyers for UST, it was the best yield in the market at that time over at 20%, right? But that is not what happened. It was sold to immediate sellers who attacked UST and Luna at the same time, caused catalyzing the collapse. Yeah, And also the curve thing was, was also upgrading and then they did some later actions and that triggered everything, right? Exactly. And and then even after it was falling, the, the UST had broken its peg. There were potential bailouts. There was a very serious offer from Binance as well as some others. And as we now know with 2020 Vision, it would have been well worth it for everyone if it had been bailed out, right? It doesn't, it, it, I would have estimated at some point it cost maybe $2 billion to fix. That would, that pales in comparison to the pain in the market that we, that we feel today, right? But for worse, it did not happen. And uh, over time, it got, you know, this, the uh, depegging cascaded and the cost would have gone up and it you know, did not get built up. And so that, that's the trigger of the death, death spiral. And that leads to Luna Tarot. That's about like a 54 billion ecosystem down to almost zero. I think maybe- In a matter maybe, of days. Yes. Yeah. I, I think there's also Galaxy Digital that was also involved as well in, in that LFG round. There's quite a lot of uh, big players involved at that point in time. I, I wanted to ask this question. Is there a world where this would have worked? Maybe as what I think even Kevin Joe or some other people were saying, maybe they shouldn't have jacked up the U rates to 20%. That was one thing. And they can actually contain the amount of, uh, because as they get larger and larger, more and more people investing yes. in the ecosystem, the fund is actually becoming more and more insolvent. So it certainly should not have happened when it did. That was a product of the of the execution uh, of, the, of the BTC, right? The Whether it could have lasted a long time into the future is, is, a, is a better question for when the anchor rate was lowered, would the adoption that soaked up that USD been sufficient to, to maintain the market cap? And I think we will almost never know, right? The, it, a decentralized stablecoin is somewhat of a holy grail in, in crypto, right? While Bitcoin may be decentralized, Ethereum may be decentralized, censorship resistant, permissionless access, all the good stuff that crypto is, stablecoins are absolutely not. They have dollars in a bank account that can are in a, you know in a, an attack vector. So this is something that was an attempt at solving that, and uh, it failed. Mm. And I think if the metaverse would have worked and have real economies because you can think of fiat as alg algorithmic stablecoin in a different way, right? Except there's a GDP, you see roads mm -hmm. built on the road, buildings built, 
you see actual economies working, running, and that's why algorithmic stablecoin in some sense should exist, but maybe it just doesn't have the economy ready from that point of view. Perhaps. I mean, I don't think it's the last time someone's going to try. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think when the Terra Luna collapse happened, the death spiral happened, what was your reaction at that point in time or from from being a you know owner of a fund and you also vested into the actual ecosystem itself? So we didn't have any exposure to UST. We had exposure to Luna from, from the LFG ramp. And for us, I was kind of watching from the sidelines. I was not in the internal war room talking about the bailouts. I was maybe on the second or third rung of that. And my reaction was that this really should have been bailed out. I, mm. I thought it then, I, I, I still think it now. And then I thought the execution should have been handled in a better way. I think there was probably a coordinated attack as well, as people mm. had over you know the course of a year or more been shorting it, talking about the death spiral over and over again, right? And, mm. and they were wrong and they lost lots of money doing that. So I thought, why, why then? And, and why this execution? Mm. So s- since you mentioned the bailout, right? How would the bailout work? work? That means a, diff- a couple of exchanges, maybe together with Binance, FTX then, and let's say we contribute, you know, 2 billion together to stop this whole thing from happening, but it still requires the Terra or the Luna, the, the governance they, to agree to it, right? Uh, they they could have just defended the peg. They could have ah. just bought, bought up UST back to one. I and see. The cost of that, probably would have been around there. It, it depends when they did it, right? But uh, hmm. So you think that they actually moved too slowly? That That's the reason why think, it happened? I think they moved too slowly. And there's also a prisoner's dilemma problem where you don't want to be the guy that does the bailout because you're bailing out everyone, right? But okay, so it goes. Are there any other trades that contributed to the collapse of 3AC then? Yeah, so actually Luna itself was not devastating for us. We just lost what we put in the LFG round. What was painful was the aftermath. So this was the first time that two top 10 crypto coins had gone to zero. Going to zero is very different than going down 80%. Uh, Going to zero means you can buy things at 20 cents on the dollar and then still lose all your money, right? And so I think the hole in the market from that was enormous. And the aftermath was too. So just to give you an idea, I think Bitcoin was down Bitcoin ETH L1s were down all like, well, 60, 70, 80% each. The credit market was freezing up. We had lots of recalls. We honored all of them during that period. And all of our spread trades, like we did lots of finance balance sheet kinds of trades, GBTC we mentioned, but also staked Ethereum and some others. And at this period, staked ETH broke its peg. All spreads blew out. GBTC discount blew out. So yeah, everyone had on similar trades, and this was the catalyst, uh, Luna. Mm. So I think a lot of all the things that catalyze us and then subsequently contribute to the collapse itself, I, th- I think it led to uh, 15th of June, although rumors have already started percolating into the press. And then Sue posted this tweet and said, we are in the process of communicating with relevant parties and fully committed to working this out. Exact words, I read it. What are you both working with the relevant parties then? And before, and what were you all trying to do? Were you all exploring other alternatives before filing for Chapter 15 bankruptcy then? Yeah, absolutely. So there were parties we were talking to about injecting capital, and it would have been better for everyone. Frankly, a Chapter 15 means that it's a full liquidation process. That that means I I am no longer in control of the company, the liquidator is. And if I look at what some of our colleague firms did, I think we could have had a better outcome. Things like debt to equity uh, conversion, an equity injection, or a even a debt token, some of our other firms did. And the reality was during that period, it was very hard to have that conversation. The media was going nuts. There were all kinds of speculation running around and uh, it didn't happen. And so the uh, creditors and us both filed for liquidation. They beat us by one day. And mm. so, uh, yeah, our, our firm is in liquidation with their li- choice of liquidity. Mm. And and those alternatives that you mentioned, I think they were only in discussion. They never got to fruition or even like close to, like maybe if we had pushed this button, it would have worked out. 
in retrospect, probably all of them were options. I can look at other firms now, arguably are in worse shape, that are not in bankruptcy. So I think that there is, I'm still hopeful that there is a way where we're, we're talking to investors and we're talking to creditors still, both about a new venture, but also about dealing with three arrows. And I, I, I still th- I'm hopeful that there's a way. I think based on the aftermath of 3AC's filing of Chapter 15 bankruptcy in early July, I think maybe personally, what have you learned and what would you have done differently? I, th- I mean, there are several things, but I mean, if I go far enough back, mm. I would say in mid-2021, two of our early partners that were part of this group wanted to retire and we bought them out. They left. And in retrospect, we should have fought to keep them or replace them with like, you know, multiple people each, right? To fill partner shoes. What we did instead is we did not. The market rallied. We we felt, you know, we were just clouded in our judgment and, uh, and yeah, that we were not scaling the firm the way we should have. So that was, that was probably one big one. The other one was after the liquidation, I should have just had blinders on to the media and focused on creditors only, and probably just had a round table and said, you know, these are what I think the options are. What do you think the options are? And if that were the case, I think we probably wouldn't be in bankruptcy. We would have found uh, one of the solutions that I just mentioned. There were a lot of allegations, theories out there. What would be your rebuttals to allegations? Like, for example, there were people claiming that you're moving money to a shell company, and there are people saying that you're posting uh, the same collateral to different lenders, or even um, there was somebody suing you saying that you take the money from trading accounts. What do you say to them then? Okay, let me address each one of those, and then mm-hmm. I can just talk more, more generally. The one million that was alleged to be moved yep. was was actually when our FTX account was liquidated. And I believe it was moved, it was moved from like a sub account to the main account. And FTX, I, I believe, settled that separately. So that was a completely false accusation at that time. Okay. The second that we had pledged collateral multiple times, it's been six months. I've never heard it from the liquidator, right? I've only heard it alleged by two firms. I've heard it alleged mm-hmm. by FTX, who now we know did multiple collateral pledges, and by the Castle Island guys at BlockFi with BlockFi. And I mean, both firms are in in bankruptcy, you know, legal action, regulatory, potential criminal. So I have to believe that a lot of the media during that period was disingenuous and it was not constructive to finding like a truth. It was rather to put up smoke and mirrors or whatever, you know, it, it was not productive. And so, yeah, I think I was too... I was I was thinking too much about what was what people were saying at that time. I really should have been thinking about creditors and just said, you know, closed door meeting. We talk with creditors. We figure this out. The 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 third one, just for completeness, you it, said, yeah, we're moving it's, money around. Do, do it, yeah, okay, the shell company. The, yeah, the last the claim. Yeah, the 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 very last person who put money in over time. Actually, we, we had a reduction of capital. Like after Luna, for example, we had some recalls. A lot of the major creditors recalled like a third of their book or something like that. The last person who put money in was Sue. Mm. So we very much believed in in our book, in our thesis, like right, right to the end. I think where we want to get to is the Castle Island guys, because I listen to sure. On The Brain podcast, even though I'm a fan, but I want to be very fair here. So I think one of the things to relating on BlockFi and also based on some of your comments on Twitter, uh, we state that, oh, I mean, we know that BlockFi has recently filed for Chapter 11 for the second time after they thought that they were in the clear with FTX being the white knight, and then they collapsed as well. I think also Matt Walsh and Nick Carter from the podcast creator, Bad Boy segments for you, you know, they play almost every week. And then you challenge them to a debate on the podcast, which they subsequently refused, I think even on neutral ground. They allege that they don't debate with scammers. I think the heart of the debate based on what I read from your tweets is, I think there were three things, right? One is about Nick Carter's pro- BlockFi argument on custodial Bitcoin or BTC. Uh, the other one is the 100 million settlement with the SEC for BlockFi, I think, uh, during 2021. And then also superior proprietary trading of GBTC with money on FTX. I think what is the heart of the, your debate with them? I think that's the first thing I want to associate, right? And the second is what arguments would you want to lay out if that debate challenge has been taken by them? Sure. So... The, 
reason we have talked on Twitter with each other is I just find that them extremely disingenuous and hypocritical. At the same time, while they're like speculating on on us, which I, I've just said are like completely false accusations, they're supporting BlockFi still to this day. And BlockFi, just for full clarity here, you know, was masquerading around as a bank in the U.S. They had to settle with the SEC for that, taking retail deposits, paying interest on them. They uh, and then were were actually acting as a relatively risky hedge fund. They followed us into GBTC, lost half a billion dollars. They fired their entire risk team, brought in someone new, and then they did some of the riskiest lending. They just lent to like two firms, us in Alameda, maybe a couple other small guys, eventually leaving all their funds on FTX. So I just find that Nick and Matt should really just look at themselves in the mirror and understand that they made an investment in BlockFi. They even put together an SPV, I think, for other investors in BlockFi, probably had their friends and others deposit onto BlockFi. Mm. And that's unfortunate. And sometimes we're wrong, but now we know that we're wrong. So at this point, I just find it absurd that they're so critical of us without even speaking to us while still actively promoting BlockFi. And I think, let's say if the bankless guys were to ask you to go on a debate with them and they agree, how would, would you... I would happily debate with them. Yeah. Mm. So you would just lay out exactly all the set, the set of things that you talk about. Like, for example, the whole thing about, you know, they are just like a crypto lender, they're doing all this proprietary trading, they're just yes, acting exactly. like a hedge fund. And I, I think one of the unfortunate things in the space is sometimes people, you know, they, they, they espouse the virtues of crypto, right? And sometimes you make a mistake, like, for example, investing in BlockFi. I invested in BlockFi early, and then as soon as GPTC went to a negative basis, I sold it, right? And for them, like... <laughs> It's unfortunate, but they're they're very much part of this Bitcoiner community, East Coast, like provincial Bitcoinerism. And and somehow they got roped into the BlockFi scam and they're still promoting it. Like, guys, it was a scam. Get over it. It's like, very similar that's to the Celsius. The, that's the yeah. way the industry heals. I, I think BlockFi is actually very similar to Celsius. I mean, from the, from the way I was looking at the company, I think I want to take on and move on from this. Based on your recent tweets on your creditors, uh, token warrants. What are the current issues with the creditors, given that you call the liquidators inaccurate, okay, based on your tweet? And what do you want to achieve by just going on public record with them on Twitter? Sure. So as I mentioned, I, I think we would have been best off if we didn't, if we never went into a full liquidation. I don't think we would, I mean, we, either we'd be in a judicial liquidation or we'd be in, in not a bankruptcy at all if we had been able to do that from the start. The reality is we're here now. And so it's been six months, like these guys, the liquidators have paid themselves a lot of money. They've distributed zero to creditors and have done very little in the asset sets. So I think there is a better way. I think that there's, you know, uh, potential restructuring kinds of ideas and or ways we can involve people with a, a new venture as well. But I think these are all discussions that I'd like to just have with creditors. And I think it's beneficial to all. Mm. But then what, 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 is, what do you want to get if you just put it out in a public record? Is it just for some form of negotiation or is this just to just set oh, the record straight no, 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 that no, no. you're not I'm, being I'm, disingenuous? Yeah. No, no, I'm reaching out to them directly. But every once in a while, the, there, there was a hearing, right? Mm. And the liquidators you know, like to put blame on us mm. that they, you know, they can continue doing what they're doing, right? And it's just... I, I feel sometimes I need to put a rebuttal out there and say, you know, like <laughs> there are other ways that you can sell the assets and you've been sitting on cash in a bank account for like months now that's not distributed, right? So furthermore, you didn't listen to what we said with Starkware. And for me, if I, you know, join these hearings, I don't get a voice at all. Sometimes I I, I can't even speak. So yeah, I, th I think th th there's a better way for it. Mm. So you hope that the creditors can directly talk to you and then try to tell the liquidators... I, yeah, I, I'm, I am slowly making the rounds to speak to all of them. And then we'll set up a roundtable discussion so that we can see if we can find a meeting of the minds. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, right now, the liquidator is in control with the fiduciary duty to the creditors. So they, they do have power if they can act together and if they have an alignment of interests. I have no, no power. Okay, I hear you on that. That I will leave you continue to work on it and hopefully achieve a good outcome with your creditors. Yeah. I want to switch subject and really go into 
something else, nothing to do with three AC, but probably related in some ways. So I, I listened to the Chopping Block podcast and I'm a fan of the Chopping Block guys. Hasid Quraish said that he visited Singapore in 2021 and meet you for lunch and you told him that you figured out the methodology on what Sang Bam, Bamman Fried or, or we call SBF was doing with FPS and Alameda. I think that I want to ask you because straight out from you, it would be much more fun to hear. Well, what's the recollection of that meeting and what did you say to him about what Alameda, SBF, and FTX is doing with rates to the token trades that they're making. Yeah, absolutely. So this was right around the time of the Serum token launch. And I, I just listened to the episode with uh, Hasib. I thought he did a great job of explaining it, but I, I'll summarize here. Basically, Serum was the most predatory token to retail I've like ever seen. It was a very high fully diluted valuation. It was a very low float. It had a seven-year vest. It had a very high concentration to the team and you know FTX Alameda. So I thought that it was initially just going to be like the purest dump on retail. But it just didn't make sense because it was too obvious. And after the launch, it it would I mean it traded up a lot. I think it was it, it, I think that round was around 10 cents. It was trading over a dollar like on day one, right? And I, I, at this point, I, I kind of realized what it was. And I just said, they must be buying. And the reason they're buying is because it's cheap for them. They own a lot of it. Majority is all locked up. And this was a time when they were hungry for credit, but also lenders were hungry to lend out. And I think if you had offered lenders, like even unlocked serum, a year prior to that, they would have said no. They would have thought it was a joke. But at that time, they were just looking for excuses to send to, to lend out more. And it might just make sense that they would even take locked serum with a seven-year, like zero liquidity on the stuff. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. It was his cheapest form of financing. Mm. I don't know whether have you heard the Matt Levine's uh, Odd Lots podcast with SBF, uh, I think during April, where he talked about the magic box analogy. I, and then, I remember seeing the quote. I don't think I saw yeah, the interview. Yeah. And then Matt Levine called him up and said, aren't you, you know, running a Ponzi scheme on yeah. top of that? And then he, he was trying to wiggle his way out. Is Serum, what he did with Serum is that form of Ponzi that you're t- talking about, where he's trying to get the highest amount of credit from retail investors with all these very restrictive c- conditions. I think so. And it was... Maybe in 2017, the Ponzi's were very simplistic. What Sam realized is that because he had a very large black box with Alameda, which was pure pure black, he owned, I think, 90%, Gary owned like 10%. So that whole thing was a black box. But also FTX was black to most people, only, only investors. And he could put things in this box that would play with the play with the knobs, right? And so for him, FTT was the first time that he saw a low, you know, a, a, like a, a token that he could post as collateral. And I think this is where he got addicted to it. And he regretted probably the way it was handled. He said, I, I could have made a lot more money. I did this whole, I did this whole FTT thing wrong. If I, you know, and for Serum, I just, I, I also remember hearing the pitch. The vision was a joke. The tech was more or less non-existent before. I mean, they had just like dreamed it up. And if I had to speculate now, I would say the timing of that was probably to because they needed to raise cash. It was not because that was the time of like peak innovation for Serum, right? So yeah, I think I think Sam realized first with FTT that this is this was possible. Then he did it with Serum, Oxy, Maps, like mm-hmm. numerous projects. Mm. So you you call the Ponzi box scheme that he came out with is basically the ICO 2.0 after the 2017. Yeah, they, they got more sophisticated. In, I, in, in ICO land, you were supposed to sell, the, the founders sold. In mm. 2021, the founders bought and, mm. and then borrowed dollars. Mm. So you, you dealt with FTX before the Luna Terra collapse, and you have also remarked that you've tussled with them previously, right? What were the red flags you all noticed regarding SBF and his team at Alameda in deals with the crypto industry in general before they collapsed? Yeah, sure. So I met them relatively early when they were doing their high interest loans. 
And one of our partners had met them in Hong Kong, asked if I could meet the guy. I met him when he came to Singapore and he walked out of a meeting on me. I was talking in kind of a circle of people asking him, I had the deck and I asked him about the 15% guaranteed loans. You can't lose money under US law. The AUM, that was very misleading. Profit part, that was very misleading. I mean, the whole deck was fraudulent on like multiple levels. And, and he walked out. And at that point, I kind of knew that the stuff was wrong. So I showed it to Sue. He, we were pretty vocal. I think Sue's done some tweets on this as well. Mm. But yeah, he, he then shortly thereafter raised FTT. We, we now guess that this was probably to fill a hole, right? And, and probably he was using you know, so, some money from one pocket to, to build an exchange on another pocket, right? So Sam had done this early on. And over time, I just kind of, as I didn't trade on the exchange for the first year and a half, I thought it was a complete bucket shop. But then he started to get real investors, um, Temasek being mm. most famous in Singapore, but also Ontario teachers, Sequoia, Paradigm, you know, some of the biggest, most respected VCs and institutions that are known for hard due diligence. And I, as a user, cannot see the inner workings, but I thought perhaps they would. And yeah, we, we eventually ended up trading on the exchange. There was a crackdown in China. I was the basic, biggest open interest on Huobi and OKX. So when we moved that over, we needed a place to go and FTX was convenient. So mm. for, for- and, 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 and you all just thought that with all those like big VC funds, sovereign wealth funds and pension teachers funds. So you all ended up also traded on FTX as a result of that. We did. Yeah. And we traded quite a bit there. I knew that there was some stuff that was probably not quite correct, but but I didn't think that they would take like client deposits. That's absurd, right? Mm. And spend client deposits, you know, have them deposit directly into Alameda that then credit onto FTX, like mm. and hunt positions, print fake tokens, insider trade. Like these are all very, very serious. Any one of those can put you in jail in the US, right? Mm. So I mean he he Arguably, this was an offshore entity. It was an antique entity, but but even still, like this was really aggressive stuff. So I just thought, given those institutions, there was no way he was going that far. I I think it's because the surprise was that the due diligence was not done very well. At least I think the Masik, as a Singaporean, where my funds are in in there, and they when they wrote out their actual memo about it, I thought that they were the only one that owned up. I think Sequoia didn't own up at first and only after that, then they put on the apology tour because of a leak to the information. So I, I was actually very surprised by the... Did any of those due diligence people just call you up and say, hey, you know, Carl, you know, you guys run 3AC. What do you think of FTX? Was, did that came, came around in the due I, diligence phase? Uh, I can't recall from any of those specific investors, but pretty much anyone that asks, I was very vocal about, about FTX in the early days. And I was told I was an idiot many, many times because FTT was a huge success for a lot of people. I knew many people that turned seven into nine figures on investing in FTT. Same goes for Serum. Same, I mean, so I was repeatedly reminded <laughs> that I was the wrong one, but th- this is the way it goes. And, and frankly, I don't blame any of these investors for their, you know, their messaging to others. At, at the end of the day, early stage investment sometimes succeeds, sometimes fails. I, I think mm. it, it, if I were just in... You know, if I were in Temasek and maybe reviewing things, I would probably just say, you know what, we're still going to do investments in early stage stuff, we're still, but we're just maybe not going to do it in our name anymore. We're going to invest in other funds that do it or, or to maybe create some, which, which they already do. Mm-hmm. But this one was just particularly painful because it was done so publicly in such a big name. And whether you like it or not, people are going to take that as a, you know, as a stamp of approval. There was one thing that happened during the New York Times interview that SPF said that actually reveals what he thinks about VCs. And he said that they only trade on the upside and they forgot, they always never think about the downside. So maybe that was how he managed to get them to put the money on. But I want to get your point of view on this. So based on the collapse and also we talk about, you know, you have also alluded that, you know, that it has been alleged. Okay. I, I just want to be clear mm-hmm. because um, the actual, you know, trials have not started, you know, all that justice department is not in yet, but, SBF had committed fraud by commingling funds between Alameda and FTX. What are your thoughts on the FTX collapse? That's one. And second is his media tour around. I think he just went to the block with Frank Chaparro as well, who tried to grill him for two hours. 
I, I, I watched that one. I see he also did one with the Wall Street Journal and Good Morning America, many others. I think that he has done enormous damage and been incredibly fraudulent in many different ways. So it's not a case of, you know, misleading investors or something. It, it, he's he's done insider. I mean, there's so many, many things that he's done. His media blitz surely is just to show ignorance over negligence. And so I don't know. We'll, we'll see if it works out for him. But I, it's just very mm. hard to believe this stuff. Mm. I, I think based on what has been alleged, right? Do you think that Sam should go to jail if all the allegations are ever proven true? Yes, yes. I, I, he, I definitely think he should. But they, they, it's really going to come down to first, jurisdiction. And second, his uh, dealings in the US. There are numerous regulators in the US. I'm sure he's violated some stuff in there. Mm. I think then it, then I want to flip it over to the Terra Luna collapse, which you lost money. What do you think about Doquan then? That is much more difficult in my mind because at the end of the day, Do designed a technology platform and it failed. So whether it is criminal is, is more a question of did he intend it to fail? Did he know that it would? Did he profit that it, from it? If those questions are all no, then maybe this is not. But if but if a judge determines that some of them are yes and there was malintent, then 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 maybe mm, that would be decided by the Korean law because they are the ones are going after him now anyway. Right, which is another question of jurisdiction as well. Right, so yeah, this is the, this is one of the tricky things about crypto. Mm, I guess because there's not much regulation on that. But I think now that everyone has gone through this this part of history. Actually, to be quite honest, it's very similar to what happened to gold in the in the 1890s when, you know, there was uh, Jay Gould causing a bank run, you know, all the market makers, the railway is your equivalent of the technology and everything else. I think maybe the question I want to ask you is, should crypto be regulated after this debacle? And how should we think about, say, risk management and governance? Then? So I will say this, uh, US regulation pushed FTX offshore and lack of enforcement allowed BlockFi to keep operating after getting a $100 million fine from the SEC. And Luna was largely not in the US, right? So the question is going to be what regulation in what jurisdiction? And I don't have a good answer for that. That's up to, uh, to other people to do mm -hmm. so. Do you think that like things like stable coins needs to be regulated? Like for example, there's a stable coin bill that was supposed to be, I think collateralized or over collateralized stable coins are okay, but algo stable coins shouldn't be allowed or something along those lines. I think in general that if you regulate the previous cycle, the market has already learned, right? So crypto in many ways is a capitalist libertarian you know, future, right? And if you are allowed to play these large experiments and they blow up, then they don't happen anymore, right? People will try new things. So if we try to regulate exactly what happened last cycle, it likely will have no bearing on what happens next cycle. That's where the problem in this regulation is, is going to be. But I think one problem with crypto or Web3, we call it, is that whatever you do, there's always an embedded capital market that sits on it. It doesn't matter what you do. And I think that is where the, the challenge really is. Because once you have an embedded capital market, you can throw any form of financial engineering, mm -hmm. risk engineering into it, right? But then let me ask you then, are you or maybe even Sue still bullish on the space and believe that the super cycle will still come someday? We, we, we are still bullish on the space. I, I, I think the aftermath of FTX has not been felt entirely yet. The That was... The, the reality is it's going to take like six months to mm. really know the full implications of that. And and then we'll start to see some regulation come through too. But but really, it's the insolvencies, the, the companies, the projects that run out of money because it will be hard to raise. All that stuff needs to flush first. And then after that, yeah, we can go super cycling again. And then question is actually all pending due to whether Genesis will be insolvent and take down the entire DCG, right? Because that's the only near extinction event that's going to happen. They're, they're not the only ones. I mean, they're, I, I really could, I'm not going to name on the show, but mm -hmm. I could name numerous firms which are likely insolvent and struggling. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no. I, I think that there is this interesting 
point of view, actually, when I met you all, I actually went and drew a map of all the lending, the hedge funds and everything, and then discovered everything led to Genesis. The, yes. the question then is that, okay, if Genesis blow, then everyone blows as well, right? But the, the real near extinction event, and I keep asking everyone, is probably is either Tether gets the pack and then cause a bank run on Binance. Well, arguably, Bitcoin should be you know nuclear proof, right? But yeah, in terms of serious, even more serious damage to the industry, there has been a massive consolidation, I would argue, that has never been seen since potentially Gox level consolidation in the stablecoin space, in the exchange space, and probably also now in the, you know, the, the DCG lending, you know, thing that he's got there too, uh, Grayscale. So I think these three are, the, the whole point of, of crypto in general is that there's decentralization, right? And choice. And this prevents, you know, attack vectors, things like that. Now we have three like pretty prominent firms, which have their own risk mitigants or whatever, but but it's just a very, like each one of those has an 80% plus market share of their dominant areas. And that is, that's not the way crypto is supposed to be. Mm. If I read you correctly, what you're saying is that it's better to be decentralized. So that's one. That means you will look at something like Bitcoin because I, I, I was listening to different podcasts. Everybody thinks that you're now all into Bitcoin and no into not I... into the other coins. Is that no, true? I was, I've been very jaded through this process and kind of understood. I've, I've, I, I started with Bitcoin and I, I've, the principles of Bitcoin, the sovereign individual, that these whole ideas, I think, are guiding principles for the space. I do think that there can be other investments and other ideas, but I think it's worth now taking a harder look at some of them. I mean, during certain periods, maybe you kind of let the innovation go. At now I think it's worth taking a like a, a good hard look and say, why do we have this giant consolidation in three areas? Why did the lending space have this giant credit bubble? And how how do we think about that? That that's very fair. So I, I probably have two more questions, but I think the first question I want to ask is that is there anything you want to say to your LPs, well, creditors, investors, investees, uh, friends, families, and employees after? this event, I'm sure it was not very easy on you. And, you know, plus all the things that's going all over the world, the media, and I think I hear some of the tussles you have and some of the things that people were saying about you. Is there anything you want to say to them? Yeah, I know there's a lot of pain and we lost all of our money in the fund. I know investors, creditors, family, friends also lost lots, lots and lots of money. And all I can say is we will, we'll do what we can. And you're sorry about it. I'm just. I just want to make sure that I. Yeah, I, I, I wish things could have happened in a different way, but at this mm. point, you know, we're gonna do what we can. Okay. So one last question would be: What are both your plans for the future? Of course, after all of these issues, turmoil, and maybe the creditors, liquidators, you know, have been resolved. Right. So we're speaking with investors, and soon will be creditors as well about a next venture. And I, I think this is just the, the, the best way forward. The liquidation process will run. I think there are better ways that we can probably do it, but ultimately that will be up to the creditors. And in terms of a new venture, I, I, I would like to include people to the extent that it makes sense. And uh, I think this is the best way. I guess the, the thing about funds, all these things is about trust. You believe that they will trust you again? I, I think this is, just, this is a fair question, right? Uh, so for creditors, I think we can include them in you know, they can invest or not invest. We can probably still include them. For new investors, yeah, it's not a question. Okay. How many thanks for coming on the Analyze Asia podcast. I wish under better circumstances, we would like to have lunch and with you and Sue. And I think we discuss other things other than crypto. So in closing, I have two very quick questions. I guess during this time, any recommendations which have inspired you recently to such dark times? Yeah. So for me, June and July were my darkest months. And I know that other people are maybe having their darkest months now. What I can say is that nothing lasts forever. The good times, the bad times, nothing lasts. If you're feeling that way, what helped me was first focusing on myself, med self-meditation, no alcohol, no medication, then family, and then rebuilding outwards. And I believe you can see the light. Mm. How can my audience find you? Other than your Twitter account, I guess 
Go to the account, right? Twitter, Twitter is probably the best one for now. Sue and I both have accounts. Mm. Uh, but yeah, maybe we can be a little bit more public in the future. Mm. And of course, you can definitely find us on Analyze Asia, A N L Y S E Asia, or tweet to me, give me your feedback as such. And we are definitely、uh, distributed across all platforms. So, Carl, many thanks for coming on the show. Take care, Sue and and yourself, and look forward to better times that we can speak again. Thank you.